Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. I'm Steve Joseph, the Vice President of Market Development here at Chevrolet. Welcome, and thank you for joining us today for this web panel, which is the third one in our What's Hot and What's Not series. I'm going to begin this event by first introducing and acknowledging all the co-sponsors, and I'll then briefly cover some logistical items before introducing Linda Pullen, who will be moderating the panel discussion. As a quick reminder, this is a 75-minute event with the discussion taking about 50 minutes, and we'll follow that with about 20 minutes of responding to audience questions. Okay, let's get started with my thanks to our co-sponsors, the first of which is Defined Health, a leading business development strategy consultancy to biotech, pharma, and investors. Oncology, CNS, cardiovascular, metabolics, and autoimmune inflammatory diseases are the firm's largest practice areas. Defined Health has been leading clients through strategic exercises in the immuno-oncology space for more than a decade and produces the esteemed and unique Cancer Progress Conference now in its 27th year. Probably many of you are familiar with this conference. The next conference will take place in New York City in March 2016 and you can find out more about it at DefinedHealth.com and at CancerProgressByDH.com. Also, along with this thank you to Defined Health, a special thank you to Jeff Bachman, who leads the firm's oncology practice. Jeff suggested today's topic, helped to identify and recruit some of our panelists, and is one of our panelists as well. Our second co-sponsor that I'd like to acknowledge and thank is the Biotechnology Industry Organization, whose Bioinvestor Forum is the leading biotech meets venture partnering meeting taking place on October 20th and 21st in San Francisco. A quarter of the nearly 200 presenting companies are oncology companies, and nearly 200 investors, including Orbimed, Venrock, SR1, Buxalta Ventures, and Fidelity Biosciences, will be there to partner. And this year, the Bioinvestor Forum is also teaming up with Stanford Spark to host an academic company presentation and partnering event on October 19th. Last year there were a record 1400 plus meetings at Bio Investor Forum and Bio expects continued growth as the climate for venture funding remains strong. So please don't miss this important event. The third co-sponsor is the Licensing Executive Society USA and Canada. Our thanks to them for their support and making their life science members in particular aware of this panel. For more than 50 years, LES has been the leading association for intellectual property, technology, and business development licensing professionals. The life sciences sector of LES, which is the largest sector, provides LES members in all areas of the life sciences industry with a great place to network, share common experiences, and learn from one another. And along with its business development courses and webinars, LES's life sciences sector is also known for the quality and value of its royalty rates and deal term surveys. If you're not familiar with those surveys, I encourage you to check them out. And finally, for those of you who are not familiar with ShareVault, we provide a cloud-based secure document sharing system and virtual data room that organizations use for sharing highly confidential documents with external parties. Within the life sciences arena, ShareVault is very commonly used by companies and tech transfer organizations for controlling and monitoring these documents, especially during licensing and partnering activities, such as the licensing of immuno-oncology assets. And because of our product leadership, as well as ShareVault's contribution to the life sciences industry in the form of sponsorship of events like this one, and a customer base in 48 countries, ShareVault service has been chosen by Bio and more than 30 other trade associations for their member benefits programs. Okay, it's time to co briefly cover some logistics. We expect there are going to be lots of questions because this is a very hot topic. So during the panel discussion, if you have a question you would like the panel to address, please submit it at any time through the questions box in your GoToMeeting control panel. We'll certainly try to get to as many of the questions as possible in the time that we have. Also, in case you can't stay for the whole time, the web panel is being recorded, and you'll be able to come back and catch the rest of it in the next seven to ten days. Now we're ready to get started with the main event. Today's moderator is Linda Pullen from Pullen Consulting. Linda is a well-known biopharma consultant who focuses on partnering 
and her extensive business development experience includes AstraZeneca, Amgen, and many other companies that you can see listed on her website, PullinConsulting.com. This event is actually the seventh in a series on licensing that Linda has done with Shareball. So Linda, thank you for the great partnership, for also helping to recruit the panelists that the audience is about to meet, for organizing the questions and topics, and for moderating today's discussion. So Linda, we're now ready for you to introduce the panel and start the discussion. Thank you, Steve. We do have a great panel today. We're going to have a lively, fun discussion with some real deep expertise. And everybody should indeed ask questions. We'll try to fit them in as we go and at the end. So first of our panelists is Jeff Bachman. As you heard, he's VP of Defined Health. He has a research background with viral diseases and cancer. He knows all sorts of stuff. He's uh, extremely knowledgeable. And I'm looking forward to him adding commercial perspective from his cross-company perspective at Defined Health. Thank you, Linda. Our second panelist is Ferran Pratt. And he has diversity all by himself. This is a man who has a PhD in organic chemistry, a JD, has worked for small companies, and is now at MD Anderson working with a wide variety of faculty and researchers on a wide variety of topics and helping structure industry partnerships. Ferran will help us remember the patients as center and help us with the most cutting edge science. Also bringing a real deep scientific background is Axel Hoos, who's Vice President of Oncology R&D and Head of Immuno-Oncology at GlaxoSmithKline, MD, PhD, uh, Axel, I'm hoping that you will help us really think about strategy and how to compete. Uh, it's interesting, Axel uh, was responsible for work of discovery and development of Yearboy at BMS, and he's now not at the first company to get an immuno-oncology therapeutic out the door, but we'll be interested to see his thoughts on how one plays this game. Last but not least is Nate Sanborn, who's at Lilly. And Nate has done all sorts of things at Lilly, from research to business development to clinical development, and he is now Director of Strategy and Business Development, supporting the Oncology Business Unit at Eli Lilly. And I think Nate will bring some interesting thoughts on competing in immuno-oncology as well as the business development perspective. So I think we've got a great panel, and let's get started. Here's a, a sort of quick snapshot of where we hope to go, giving you a bit of flavor for the topics we'd like to try to cover today. There's a lot of topics, but we're absolutely interested in hearing your questions as well. So please do use that question box. So let's start at the beginning. What is immuno-oncology? What does cancer do to evade the immune system? And why is immuno-oncology so hot now? So who wants to start with a quick synopsis of what is immuno-oncology? Maybe we can turn to the next slide, Steve. Yeah, so good afternoon, and thanks for the introduction. Uh, I can give this a first uh, shot. Uh, immuno-oncology in my, in my book is, in simple terms, the use of the immune system to fight cancer. Obviously, that can be done in many different ways. And we have actually uh, had this idea more than a century ago and have had not the tools to understand the mechanisms of the immune system or develop any, uh, you know, mechanism-based drugs at the early stages of this um, timeline. But with the understanding of immune mechanisms, the, uh, the development of new tools like monoclonal antibodies to target immune mechanisms, the picture has changed quite dramatically. We have had, in the last 20 years, many approaches, mostly cancer vaccine-like uh, approaches towards immune manipulation. Those have not yet been successful, mostly because we did not fully appreciate the immunosuppressive side of the immune response. So, you know, you can stimulate the immune response, but you can also suppress it, and the immune system usually tries to um, create balance between stimulatory and suppressive mechanisms. So uh, with the understanding of what's now called checkpoint blockade as the mechanisms that control immune response, we're now in a better place uh, successfully manipulating immune responses and achieving clinical benefit that comes from that. And as you know, cancer is uh, a disease that arises from the body's own tissue. And the immune system tries to create some kind of a balance, not to uh, have destructive responses against its own tissue. 
So having said that, I think we will have a huge opportunity here to um, use the immune system against cancer. We have just started to scratch the surface. And if I may, uh, I would say that we actually have already seen three generations of successful cancer immunotherapies as of the trigger point of 2011 where uh, ipilimumab or Yavoy was launched and triggered a lot of interest in cancer immunotherapy across the community. So if I dissect these three generations, the first one is the launch of immuno-oncology and the term actually emerged with the emergence of Yavoy in 2011. The second generation is the expansion of this area into the PD-1, PD-L1 axis of checkpoint modulation. A few other things have happened in parallel to that, less impactful but are important, which are glenotumumab, the bispecific antibody that was uh, licensed earlier this year, and actually the CAR-T approach that emerged almost at the same time with clinical data of relevance as the uh, checkpoint approach with epilimumab. So that I would call that generation two, and we're now entering really generation three, with a variety of new approaches, and I'm counting nine, but there could be more, to modulate the immune system. So I think we're opening the door now to a very wide open playing field. So it is incredibly exciting and, and there are many things happening. Why don't we touch on what the early data made us think about? Well, I'll, I can make some comments and then I think uh, Axel and others can, can chime in even more. I mean, I think one of the questions that often gets asked, and this goes back to one of your earlier introductory comments about, you know, or even the title as to why is this so hot, still get questions from clients and, and others in the industry as to is this a, a, a frenzy, is this a tulip craze, you know, how is this different from many of the other um, yes. trends that have come before? and you know, uh, and the answer is quite simple. It is not just qualitatively, but it is quantitatively different than what we've seen before. You know, except for a few rare exceptions, if you look at the history of where we've gone with targeting of various nodes within cancer or even more recently the quote-unquote targeted agents going after uh, alleged key, if not driver mutations, the problem with the majority of those is in some cases while you may have high response rates, you have very poor uh, durability and you also have resistance emerging really rapidly. What's very different with these new immuno-oncology agents, and particularly with these checkpoint inhibitors, um, is not just the response rates, but the outcomes and the durability. Not that they we're there yet necessarily, certainly not as monotherapy, but the fact that um, you can see these impressive monotherapies in previously quite problematic settings like melanoma or in you know, later stages of, of lung cancer, speaks to the fact that these are doing something very different than the other cancers uh, types of agents. And the other point I would want to make here is that aside from the fact that their actual data uh, is impressive, not in all cancers and, and not always will they want to be used uh, as monotherapies, and we'll talk about that, but also the uniqueness of the immune system. So echoing back to you know, Axel's uh, earlier comments, you know, this is a situation where the immune system by definition is plastic, flexible adaptable, adaptive immunity, um, and so it is in some ways the best match for the cancer which has always been considered so problematic because of its plasticity and heterogeneity, et cetera. I'll stop there and let others add. Go ahead. I think that, so this is Nate, uh, so my comments to that, I appreciate Jeff and, and Axel's view of, of how uh, this really has come together and come to fruition, especially with the clinical data, and as we see the response rates and we see really the opportunities uh, to, again, magnify within this space, um, you know, this efficacy. Um, what I think is also important is as we look at the opportunities as well, the response rates are high, but they're not as high as they, they could be. And, and I think that in the context of the amino oncology, why it's hot is we have piqued the interest, as Axel put it, and, and we are, though, just scratching the surface. The, the mechanisms, I think, and the interest and the options of the immune system where it may be target independent at some level, meaning you know, the target of the cancer itself, and we're able to uh, really um, tweak the immune system to attack the cancer cells. I think that's also creating um, the idea that there may be a, a more broadly efficacious medicine that um, may not need to be as targeted 
as it has been in the past, but also as we explore that, it creates you know, new biology. As we look at this, that also creates new opportunities because there are even targets within the immune system, as we all know, that um, create opportunities for uh, tweaking the immune system in a certain way that uh, then also uh, creates opportunities to really explore that and, and pursue it further. Yeah, I'll just amplify on one comment that you made, uh, um, Nate, and I think, and, and Axel also referred to this, but um, this idea of the multiplicity of targets, and I want to emphasize that it's not, you know, it's not just targets, but it's approaches, right? I mean, immuno-oncology is not a monolithic entity. It includes so many different approaches. Axel named a few, the antibodies, the checkpoint inhibitors, um, clearly vaccines, um, which there is one approved, being Provenge, uh, for better. Or worse, but it, it was the first uh, in the space really uh, of any significance uh, to get approval. Um, but you know, beyond that, there are a whole range of there's the costimulatory agonist, there's oncolytic viruses, so let's not forget um, uh, Amgen's TVEC, um, and the bispecifics, of course, um, a whole range of, of targets, not just on T cells, but an interest in targeting T regs and other regulatory components, certainly uh, the innate immunity side with uh, toll agonists and, and related. So there's a vast array. I mean, even within any of these categories like vaccines, that is not monolithic entity. It contains so many different types of uh, approaches. And so I think, you know, this is this is great uh, opportunity for companies, but ultimately great opportunity at, at the end of the day for patients because there are so many different ways to get at this. And many of these will be combinable um, and will have at least some type of additivity uh, and then the challenge, which I'm sure we'll talk with eventually and probably get questions on, will be, um, you know, some of the issues of, of how you deal with that as strategic and, and other issues of, of how to do these combinations. So why don't we go ahead to the next slide, please. It is incredibly hot, and, and I think you're arguing well for the tremendous potential and the special place. Will everybody who wants to sell cancer drugs have to be in immuno-oncology? So I'm, I'm taking a daring stab at this and make a prediction. At the moment, so at the present time, and in the, in the short term, the answer to that would be no. Not everybody needs to be in immunology to have a viable um, business model. As we see immunology grow and replace standards of care, and we are seeing that already with some of the checkpoint modulator phase three programs that have emerged in a very short period of time, Chemotherapy is being pushed aside. I expect that over time we see combinations and uh, we will see additional monotherapy approaches where standards of care will at least be challenged if not replaced. And in the long term, uh, immunotherapy will probably dominate oncology. So having said that, for every serious company that wants to develop oncology drugs, it becomes an inavoidable component of their portfolio. Not immediately but certainly in the long term. So does everybody agree that this is a place you'll have to be in the long term? Yes, I agree. Uh, this is Nate. I, I think that uh, in the long term, IO undoubtedly will uh, continue to, to drive new developments in the biology. Again, we're, we're just approaching what are some new mechanisms and some new modalities. Um, I, I do think that some driver mutations and some other um, types of tumor-based genetic you know, mechanisms are still going to be on the horizon as well, but to think that um, a company could survive merely on those types of approaches without having also a complement in, in an I.O. space, I, I just don't think that that is necessarily uh, possible. And how much of your licensing effort is focused on immuno-oncology in licensing effort? So again, I'd be happy to make the first point. From the GSK side, uh, our focus is almost entirely on immuno-oncology right now. Not 100%, but the vast majority is. That in part has to do with the unique situation that GSK finds itself in. Right. Uh, most of you know that uh, GSK had a strategic transaction with Novartis uh, that was executed earlier this year, where we divested our marketed oncology drugs to Novartis. What we retained was the R&D pipeline, and we're using the R&D pipeline, which are already to almost 50% was immuno-oncology at the time, uh, and built that out now very strategically on the main areas of immuno-oncology, epigenetics, and cancer stem cells. So uh, our focus right now is in order to 
be a lead player in immunology. We're going to focus on immunology. And, uh, you know, we've been in stealth mode for a while. We're not even mentioned when most uh, immunology uh, lead uh, organizations are being discussed. But that will change uh, once we unveil what the portfolio looks like. I can add the perspective on, on the MD Anderson yeah, yeah. side in the sense yeah. that we don't have a, a particular strategy. Um, we go pretty much where the science tells us to go. And I can say that almost 90% of our activity is based on immuno-oncology. Yeah. All the large transactions we have done uh, in the past, Merck, Bristol-Myers, Astellas, Intrax, and it, it goes on and on. And every single one of them has been in immuno-oncology. So if you look at it, and it's in a way an, an unbiased sample because it's not uh, swayed by a particular company strategy uh, that needs to make its niche within a much broader healthcare landscape, it, it is just astounding the, the, the weight of immuno-oncology nowadays in, in, in the field of cancer. That could be the, the quote of the session this far. Uh, we'll wait and see if anybody can top that quote. That's great. Nate? Sure. Yeah. So with regard to the, the effort, uh, I think uh, at Lilly we have a large majority of effort in the IO space. Uh, I think we've been um, quite successful over the last uh, year and a half with regard to both the, uh, the licensing uh, as well as the clinical collaborations and you know similar to what Axel was mentioning as far as three generations of, of development here in the IO. A continuum, you know, we do see that it similarly in that uh, you, we do have kind of waves of, of innovation that are coming forward. And and while we haven't had at, at Lilly uh, a PD1 or a PDL1 that is out front, uh, we do feel that we have you know very solid combinations. And so what we're looking at is you know as an effort is we've done uh, some clinical phase program reviews as well as early phase and and really getting at the biology as well of what are those novel approaches that are really immunologically based and how do we gain access to those and, and obviously in the IO space I think that's a similar storyline to what a lot of folks are looking at. Right. So if somebody comes to you with an ADC or uh, another targeted approach, do you really require them to demonstrate combinations with immunotherapies to be interested? I'm all answer first and it's, it's kind of a short one and that is uh, to what Farron said earlier, the data have to drive the debts, that decision. I think uh, we would always um, be evaluating it based on what we think the combinability is. Um, I wouldn't say that we always require the combination data um, up front as a standard, but the data need to drive the decision. Yeah, I would echo that. Uh, from the GSK perspective, we do the same. The data drive the decision. Our strategic focus is at the moment on immuno-oncology, but we do look at other things, uh, just a lot less commonly so. And there is one other thing that one might want to mention. We do actually look at the immunological characteristics of a non-immunotherapy agent. From a licensing perspective, but also within our own portfolio, uh, we still have retained a few uh, assets that are not immuno-oncology agents. And we retain them particularly because they have immunological features that lend themselves to combination therapy. And, uh, you know, we understand a lot more about what a systemically administered uh, agent can do to the immune system, even if it was designed mechanistically to address pathways in tumor cells. It is given to the whole body, and the immune system will be exposed. And understanding that can uh, make it more useful for subsequent combination therapy development. Right. I think that's an important to emphasize, Axel, too, because so many people, you know, realize now that many of the traditional agents that have been utilized, whether they're multi-targeted kinase agents or many others, have an immunologic component. In some cases, it may even be a significant component of their activity and efficacy being driven by that ability of the immune system to be modulated by application of those agents and before when no one was looking and they were using xenografts in uh, immune compromised mice, you would never see those things. I mean, I think even the interesting data coming out now about the role of 
targeting VEGF in the tumor microenvironment and the interaction there with the immune system is just a good example of this type of interaction with things not traditionally considered I.O. historically. Well, that, you know, I see that as virtually every company claims their direction fits with I.O. and so what doesn't fit with I.O. is an interesting question. Um, <laughs> very little if, if you're a small biotech. Right, right. Well, maybe we'll go on to the next slide. We're going to talk about the first approach, which is antigen presentation. And do you specifically seek things that increase the presentation of tumor antigens? Uh, this is Nate, so I, I, I'll uh, take a, a quick shot at that. I, I think that, you know, from a licensing perspective, um, you know, increasing antigen presentation just as a general mechanism is, is not one that we would say is, is high on the list just from the perspective that it's broad-based and, and it's, it's not as specific as what we would like to see. Um, so I, I think that just general chemotherapies can increase antigen presentation and you will see that, um, you know, in various forms um, throughout the, that uh, types of, of treatments within the immunity cycle and things that fit against that. So I think as far as just general antigen presentation, uh, not, not as much. I think as we think about tumor infiltrating lymphocytes and we think about what potentially are some antigens either within uh, on the, the T cell or, or uh, within the tumor itself uh, which are uh, unique and so forth. Those are approaches that we do think that have the longer term possibility of having biology play out that would really make sense. And so you know, those are uh, interesting approaches from a, a licensing perspective. Um, actually, we have a different view um, at MD Anderson in the sense that we see how uh, there is a, a limited reach to the current approaches on checkpoint blockades. And if we have to go to uh, breast, to colorectal cancer, to um, all the other ones that are not just, all the tumors that are not antigenic by, its, by themselves, um, this is a, an actual must. On the one hand, yes, a lot of things um, cause neoantigens to be uh, to be displayed. On the other hand, it hasn't been proven. And our uh, view is that whoever gets first there and and can prove it will actually gain tremendous advantage. Um, even if then other people will will come right after, but still. Uh, even when you look at PD-1, the fact that there are other PD-1s doesn't mean that uh, Merck and, and BMS are doing exceedingly well. And we believe that uh, the major the major cancers, breast, uh, colorectal in particular, prostate, um, will be tackled uh, in great part by antigenic, antigenic uh, presentation. Whereas others like pancreas, for example, it's much more a matter of, of T cell infiltration. Uh, I add to that by just saying, of course, antigen presentation plays into the space of cancer vaccines. And uh, we have a long history investigating cancer vaccines. We've had also a lot of unsuccessful approaches, which is not to say that antigen presentation or providing uh, antigens to the system to stimulate immune responses is not important. It's a matter of finding its place, and we haven't yet found that place. Uh, as we just heard from Farah, neoantigens are becoming quite interesting because they are focusing the immune response on particular targets instead of just taking any target, as we have done frequently uh, in the past. So maybe that will help, but it may also require other modalities to maximize the effect, and that could mean that the checkpoint modulatory approaches that we're currently pursuing with so much success could be uh, useful combination agents. The systematic approach, investigating vaccines together with checkpoint modulatory agents, is something that still hasn't been done yet. There have been bits and pieces, but not very systematic. And we will need to understand that better before we really can say what the role of antigen presentation in itself will be. Uh, I agree, Axel. That is a great point. So what kind of data would be necessary to get licensing interest on a vaccine approach, an antigen presentation approach in cancer? Would they need to do that systemic exploration, or would you be excited if they got some particularly great data in combination with the PD-1? 
That's a good question, Linda, and, and, and uh, I think that as we think about, again, getting back to the data would drive the decision, uh, Farron, I'm sure, knows very well as far as the animal models that they have and, and the other work that's been done in the space being able to take the biology, validating it through what could be animal models, but also through the immune system models to demonstrate, you know, the, um, the cause and effect uh, leading to uh, both the immune stimulation as well as impact on the, on the tumor is really where we want to get to. So when we talk about what data are needed for an amino oncology agent or whether it's any, any uh, you know, program we would evaluate to license um, across the board, the data have to connect with the, uh, the the biology, the animal models, and the validation. Um, does that require clinical uh, validation? I mean, that's a question that it is somewhat case by case dependent. Um, but we would say that uh, from a Lilly perspective, what what we really want to make sure of as we're evaluating the data are that um, the the immunology uh, data and and the uh, the stimulation or the agonism or the, the checkpoint uh, you know impact is uh, lining up with both the biology that was expected in the tumor and the microenvironment and then leads to the anti-tumor activity in a model that is uh, validated. Challenging mechanistic clarity. Go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to amplify on, on what Axel was also saying and then what uh, Nate said because um, although it is still relatively nascent <clears throat> uh, and certainly has not been explored um, systematically uh, nor comprehensively, as, uh, as Axel indicates, um, still when you look at clinicaltrials.gov, for example, and use that as a surrogate of activity and look at the number of combination studies being done with checkpoint inhibitors, a very solid proportion of those are, in fact, combinations of checkpoint with vaccines. Um, of course, you know, these vaccines still constitute actually a pretty large majority of the pipeline uh, of IO agents because so many of them started, you know, long before um, the current age of immuno-oncology as defined by these, uh, by Yervoy and Apivo and, and Keytruda, et cetera. So, um, so I think part of that is just a function of, you know, only a limited time now that we've had some of these key tools to do those combinations. So I think the the um, ability to more systematically uh, and comprehensively um, study them um, is just starting to occur, and it will take a couple years. But nevertheless, there are deals that are being done um, by companies trying to study um, either in the collaborative model that we've seen a lot of with IO, their, um, their vaccine approaches with people who own checkpoints, or in some cases, you know, outright licensing or acquisitions um, of, of these either by the vaccine companies, um, say take a case of Aduro who just acquired uh, Bionovian in order to access their checkpoint inhibitors and control their own, um, or other situations where you know the companies are are reaching out to the vaccine um, um, smaller companies such as BMS and um, uh, with the, the Bavarian Nordic deal, et cetera. So I think uh, it is very nascent as as, um, as Axel says, but I think it's going to be a large and burgeoning area. And, of course, that then begs the question, as, as was also previously discussed, of how relevant it is to target, you know, many of these vaccines are still based on defined uh, choices of tumor-associated antigens, which is, you know, in contrast to the idea of these neoantigens, which really are unique and one-offs from each patient to another patient. Um, and those are kind of two very different ideas, if you, on the one hand, right, preparing some off-the-shelf, uh, antigen or antigens defined targeted vaccine approach versus, say, the highly personalized mutinome uh, or immunome uh, analysis that might lead to a personalized neoantigen driven vaccine that would be combined with some type of checkpoint inhibitors. Uh, to come back to what I was saying, um, I would also agree with what Jeff said, and, and to come back, as we talk about increased antigen presentation, you know, that, that's somewhat um, not specific. Um, and, and so I think that you know, to what uh, the others have commented around, you know, specific antigen presentation and, and how that gets placed within the tumor microenvironment and within the immune system, we do feel is very key. Yeah, yeah. To, to add to that, if you think about how much effort we have spent in the genomic era to identify mutations and new targets for cancer intervention, uh, some of that work will actually now play nicely into utilizing some of these mutations as neoantigen targets for vaccine right. approaches. 
So we're scratching the surface. I mean, next generation sequencing is coming in to help us very quickly identify the fingerprint of a tumor in terms of mutation status, not just mutation load, but also very unique target specific for that particular tumor, uh, which could be created uh, as personalized vaccines or even personalized uh, T cells uh, through a TCR or CAR T approach. So we're really scratching the surface here. Yeah, I want to. Yeah, I want to keep moving. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. But let's talk about the checkpoints a little bit more. Um, I think one of the really important concepts in this is the idea that PD-1 antibodies may be a backbone therapeutic. Who wants to talk about what that means and how that impacts oncology, competitive space? Nate, you want to start that one off? Sure, I can start off. I, I think um, you know Axel and, and Jeff probably have uh, the the most background here, but uh, I, I think as a backbone therapeutic, what what we see is again getting back to kind of the um, uh, not necessarily the the target uh, the, the I'm sorry the, the tumor target expression versus the immune approach can be broader and and it's not. Um, you know, just specific to one tumor type potentially, but can be broadly applicable. We think that that's important and can can become a backbone based upon the fact that it does tweak the immune system. It's it's uh, one of the leaders, both from a safety and an efficacy perspective, as an agent. Um, and then you have a number of other combinations that have already been in development. Uh, many of which we have in in our uh, you know, product uh, portfolio or our, our pipeline, where we do think. There's a, you know potential for that combination to be uh, important and relevant. So as a backbone, we we see it as uh, an important agent that can tweak the immune system. While you have uh, other agents, to Jeff earlier point, that may hit another part of either the microenvironment or the tumor, and the uh, combination approach is is going to be key. Um, and, and so that's why we we do see it as you know, an emerging backbone that will be important across uh, a number of tumor types. Yeah, I will add to that actually by making a very simple statement. Uh, almost all the promise that we currently see in cancer immunotherapy originates from checkpoint modulation. Most of the striking clinical data comes from here, not exclusively, but the very vast majority. And in part that is because uh, this is a universal mechanism. It isn't tied to any specific tumor histology. It's not tied to any specific mutations. It is a more broad modulation of the immune system or the immune response. And you can do that through a variety of um, pathways uh, that are all checkpoints. So as such, because there are universal targets, they lend themselves well to be backbones. We've, we're seeing that with CTLA-4 really as a starter, and it's being over... Uh, you know, overtaken already by the PD-1, PD-L1 approach, and you will see PD-1 blocking or PD-L1 blocking antibodies to become backbone therapies because of the time at which they were introduced. But as we learn more about other checkpoints, I'm pretty convinced the next generation will fill a lot of gaps that these early checkpoints have created, and uh, they may gaps also the way, provide, they may gaps provide the other backbones. Gaps in what way? What kind of gaps? Gaps. Uh, not every patient benefits. So right. even though the response rates are high with some of the PD1s or PDL1s, not every patient has a response. Not every patient has benefit. And even with these agents, there is there is um, relapse. So right. there is still a lot of open spots for providing patient benefit beyond the first wave of checkpoint modulation. And we see but that you combination. see other checkpoints as liable to deliver much of that. Is that correct? Well, they contribute to that. I don't know the, the, the full answer to the story yet. I don't think anybody does. But I can tell you that immunologically speaking, some of the pathways of the immune system uh, that are not addressed yet can actually play a role where PD-1 or PD-L1 don't provide benefit. And you could actually also see combinations to uh, make a difference. We have to test this and we actually have to immune profile patients to identify the right patients for the right drug. We're really just beginning to do that. The PDL1 status in the tumor is the very first step in that direction. 
it's not a perfect marker, but it provides some important information, and there are others coming. So you will see a variety of uh, you know approaches to dissect apart the immune status of the patient and predict response, or also not to be forgotten, predict toxicity. Right. Actually, I'm I'm really curious to see how all of this is going to pan out. Uh, even here at MD Anderson, we are working on a best-in-class PD-1. Because if you look at the interactions of PD-1 with PD-L1, PD-L2, B7H4, it's not a clean one-to-one -one, um, binding in the slightest. It's actually extremely complex. Um, and and we, I actually believe that there is a role for the best-in-class PD-1, uh, which will evolve over time. And if that's the case, I mean, it may be us or it may be somebody else. If that's the case that there is going to be a best-in-class PD-1, what's going to happen with all the other 12 or 20 PD-1s exactly. that are in development? Yeah. I, I'm really curious to see how all of this is going to pan out. Uh, I'm yeah, I think that's a that. very interesting point um, because, um, yeah, you raised Farron, because I was going to, I was going to, um, kind of amplifying what Axel said and, uh, about this backbone idea, because I sometimes make the, although I think it's a flawed uh, analogy, it has some relevant resonance for those who have a long history in oncology, which is, you know, that the checkpoint inhibitors, and right now that's defined by the PD or PDL1 agents, are not unlike the taxanes were historically, right? They were the foundational chemocytotoxic backbone uh, combined with many other cytotoxic across many different tumor types and multiple lines of therapy. Um, so in a similar way, you know, the checkpoint inhibitors are now the new generation to kind of fulfill that role where everyone will want to try and combine on top of those. But that also raises the question, as you point out, is can there be or will there be a best in class? And I think the challenge in oncology is it's very unclear what that really means, right? The precedence for best in class is limited. Uh, what often happens is that the, the first in class often becomes by default best in class because the accumulated data and evidence so entrenches that player that unless something is so dramatically different um, that it's very hard to point to examples of where something's come along and truly displaced as opposed to just carving out an adjacent spot. Um, so I'm not saying that there won't be or or couldn't be or shouldn't be a best-in-class PD agent, but at the same time that, you know, many people are pursuing that, there's a whole slew of next-generation targets that, as Axel said, may become the best-in-class checkpoint as opposed to just the best-in-class PD-1 agent, not to mention the co-stimulatory agonist and then all the combinations thereof. And I think, to go back to what also what Axel said, the need for the precision medicine to try and determine who and which tumors, and the, so that's a combination of patients' own immune background and the specifics of their cancer at that time, uh, will benefit from which particular combinations and agents. And therefore, the more agents we have, the more in the, in the armamentarium, and maybe even different uh, PD agents or CTLA-4 agents will, you know, have a, a value in different patients. So I think there's a there's still, you know, a lot of learning to do, but certainly a lot of need for, I think, a range of mixing and matching of different types of modalities in order to get ultimately where we want to get, which is the idea that, you know, we can move the bar from 20 to 40 to 80 percent or more of patients in many of these tumor types um, that are going to have long, durable remissions that we might, quote, unquote, call a cure. They may still need intermittent therapy. That also is a wild card that remains to be determined for how to use these agents, so. Yeah, I think that's yeah, a great so topic. If I, if I may add a, a point here, I think that's actually quite relevant. The concept of the best in class comes from a time when we had the luxury to add a incremental benefit on top of an existing incremental benefit that the first in class and then later to be overcome by a best in class uh, could provide. Uh, we will not see that same thing in exactly that form again here with these checkpoint modulators. They're already providing massive benefit. Trials get longer if you want the survival rate out. To try and improve over a well-working PD-1 with a slightly better PD-1 uh, is a study that nobody is willing to do if, uh, for the benefit that it will add. It's probably more effective to look for other impact on the same pathway 
like the belt and suspender theory that we have heard about uh, blocking PD-1 and PD-L1 at the same time through a combination approach might get you more than slightly improving on PD-1 alone. And combinations might buy you more than trying to uh, improve slightly over the impact of the single checkpoint blocker. So in the long run, the field moves so fast. There's so much on wealth of new opportunity here with new targets and new, um, new molecules that I don't think we'll have the time and the luxury to do uh, replacement trials for PD-1s. Guys, I think so, we need to move on to the next topic, even though this is a great topic and we can talk a lot more in those. That'll be the next topics. session, all on that topic. Yeah, yeah. How about co-stimulatory agents? Are they scary? Uh, the classic say, generics, and what are exciting targets in this space? How do you think about how crowded this space is? Excellent. I love Ox40, as you, as most of you know already. So, uh, Axel, take, take it from here. Well, it is, a, it is an interesting question, of course, because we have spent most of the time so far on uh, checkpoint blocking antibodies and have been quite successful. Uh, the field is shifting towards now looking at agonists or checkpoint stimulating targets. OX40 is the first. There are already four of them in the clinic. Uh, one of them actually comes from GSK. And uh, there are others emerging. There are some targets that I have a very particular interest in because I think they can make a big difference. And uh, we, will, we will see how this plays out. But there's absolutely no reason to believe that, or, that um, agonist antibodies cannot make a major uh, impact on cancer and may not play well together with checkpoint blockers because these are distinctly different pathways and they may very well coexist. Right. Yeah, we all know that uh, the clinical development of, of these agonists is a little bit more complicated. But here at MD Anderson, we have great faith that they will be uh, maybe as important as the blockade. And that's why we outlicense OX40 to, to GSK. And Axel is, is being a tremendous champion of that. I'd love to skip ahead and at least have a few minutes on the extremely exciting approaches of providing NK and CAR T cells. Um, clearly, there's been some great early data. We're all looking to see if it'll go on into solid tumors. Uh, will an off switch need be needed? Is allogeneic going to replace autologous, or are we really going down the personalization path? Who wants to give us a few minutes? on this huge topic. Yeah, so just maybe making one point on uh, innate immunity, I would actually call it that, instead of just uh, NKs. Uh, you know, the, f the field started with T-cells. Almost all the approaches that we're taking right now, and almost everything we have discussed, is actually strongly focused on modulating T-cell immunity. There are two other parts of the immune system that we should consider. The next one is innate immunity, as we're just now touching on. NK cells are at the forefront, but macrophages belong there, and a, a variety of other cell types that could be modulated. So I see that checkpoint modulation, just using different targets for NK cells, can be relevant and uh, could be supplementary to what T cells can deliver. So this is really the next frontier. It belongs in my book in the third generation of immuno oncology agents. And then if you uh, Look at the third arm of the immune system, which is B cell immunity. We haven't even gone there yet, trying to stimulate antibodies to provide a, a supplementary effect to what T cells can deliver. We know that antibody responses work very well from a prophylactic perspective when we make uh, prophylactic vaccines. They're extremely successful. They're probably one of the most successful tools we have created in modern medicine. Uh, and the B cell itself can be used for therapeutic approaches. So I see untapped potential here, and that's going to be the next the next wave after we have um, broadened our activities uh, in T cells and in NK cells or innate immunity. So all in all, this will uh, not be necessarily a personalization, but just a broadening of the mechanisms that we have at our disposal. Yeah, it, it is an absolutely fascinating subject. Uh, uh, M.D. Anderson, we have an alliance with Selectis. Obviously, we, we did the deal with Intraxon. Um, NK cells uh, is really going to be the next, the next frontier. 
uh, I mean, they are not called natural killer cells for 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 anything. Uh, it's just that they have been difficult to characterize, to handle um, overall, make cars. But but I see strides being made in that field um, because now we we kind of have a template. Uh, we have a template on on what happened on T cells, and most importantly, uh, now people realize that it matters. Um, Immune oncology. I, I remember. Uh, I think it was Jim Allison that he was explaining how at an ASCO conference he once spoke in a room that was in between the men's and the women's bathrooms, mm -hmm. and uh, things have changed. Uh, now it's 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 hot. There is attention. There is money, and uh, and something like NK cells that before was kind of obscure. Now it gets a lot of attention, and and I see tremendous progress being made. Yeah, and I actually may add one more point here. I focused my answer on natural killer cells earlier. Uh, when we stay with the T cell story and look at CAR Ts and TCRTs or T cell receptor transduced T cells, mm -hmm. uh, the focus here has been on CD19 because it's such a uh, exquisite target and it has delivered so far very good clinical activity but it is the surf is scratching the surface and we have just seen that the next target actually for solid tumors with NYE so one uh, and a TCR approach has delivered in the first uh, uh, clinical trial of 10 patients with sarcoma a 50% response rate so this can be done and uh, it will require fine-tuning. There's a lot more uh, in terms of supply chain, manufacturing optimization, and other steps to be taken. But this is uh, a very attractive approach. We're basically, we are basically creating the army of T-cells that's supposed to fight the tumor. Uh, one thing I'd like to say about this as well is that in the long run, because of the complexity that this has, and the many components that are needed to apply it widely across many different tumor types. I personally view this as a big pharma approach. It takes a platform uh, and it takes a lot of resources and time to make this work broadly. So I think uh, big pharma with Novartis having taken a first step, with GSK now building a large platform technology around cell and gene therapies, actually having filed the first regulatory submission for an approval of a cell and gene therapy, not in cancer, but in rare diseases. Uh, we're pushing towards you know, making this a platform approach and having a long-term view on it. This, these will be medicines. Cells will be medicines. The question is, how quickly can we translate this into an effect for a large number of patients? Now, think of it 20, 10, 15, 20 years from now as a Harvard Business Review case study, because while all this pro pro progress is happening on next and next and next gen, um, you know, adoptive cell therapy approaches, whether allogeneic, uh, there are people working on kind of dual targeting to address some of the specificity issues of going after solid tumors, um, obviously the various suicide gene to uh, put in some safety features, uh, putting in um, actual gas pedals to increase activity, all this is ongoing. Um, at the same time and in parallel that you have the antibody approaches of uh, T-cell engagers and MTAX, et cetera, um, which one could view as competitive, and that all in the context of all the many other approaches that are out there. So at the end of the day, I think it is a very powerful and unique idea to go with these um, cell approaches, but at the end of the day, I think it still will remain to be seen, you know, how well they perform uh, and at what price point and what the outcomes are for patients against alternatives that do very similar types of things, um, but maybe in a much more facile way. And Nate, I really want you to, you or others to touch on the yeah. business yeah. model. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate it. So, so I, I think from, yeah, from a business model perspective, let's, you know, from a car uh, T approach, I, I think to Axel's point, it is, it is a big, kind of a big pharma platform and it does take a large investment when you think about um, taking to commercialization what is a personalized approach and I think we could all debate you know the, the dendrion experience uh, you know for pluses and for minuses as Jeff mentioned before um, there are experiences there though to, to be learned from um, but I, I think it does need to be a platform approach it's it's not a one-off opportunity as you think about CAR-T and, and uh, really the manufacturing and application to the patient 
Um, you know, to the question of does it expand into solid tumors, you know, one question I would have is does it need to? You know, as you think about the opportunities to uh, identify ways to use T cells that may be, um, you know, within the body versus um, having to be manipulated, uh, you know, ex vivo, what we think is that there may be opportunities to do that as well. And I think the biology and opportunities that fit into this space are also, you know, uh, unique um, licensing opportunities, if you will, and, and interesting science that um, for us are, are also intriguing biology because uh, we do, you know, those do exist and, and we continue to build on some of the partnerships we've already created um, in this space, but we do think T cells are quite important um, and, and you know, NK cells and some of the data and the in innate immunity are, are intriguing, um, but also from, you know, as we talk about licensing in amino oncology, um, there are still some that, some they're intriguing, but some of the data also need to yet kind of develop a little bit to so show some of that broader view. I think it's in the early days, but I do think there's a lot of promise there. But undoubtedly, uh, CAR-Ts does take a platform approach or else uh, it gets uh, quite complex very quickly. Right. And if we add in gene editing to uh, put in a checkpoint inside a CAR-T and uh, we also have an off switch for the uh, toxicity, that mechanistic clarity that pharma likes becomes pretty doggone complex to demonstrate as well. We're fast running out of time. Can we touch on combinations? You know, I think this is such an important topic. I'd love to hear a few comments about this tremendous complexity of combinations and the challenges of combination development. And what does it take to show a combination is important? Everybody is making combinations. What's the essence of what the deliverable is for a combination study? Um, I do see in that subject a lot of wrong-headed moves. Um, I've seen that a lot of the alliances um, happening right now, it's mainly because of two reasons. Um, one, it's because it's just what the companies have on the shelf. Or two, uh, combined with one, it's because the CEOs know each other or the heads of business development or the CSOs know each other. And let's give it a shot. Um, I do believe that companies can and should be a lot more thoughtful about that, especially in, in, in this particular field where we have seen, for example, that if you take advantage of window of opportunity studies and you can give an, in, an investigational dose um, on this window of opportunity, you can see how the immune system evolves. Um, What's happening to the T cells? Is PD1 expressed? Is Ox40 expressed? Is ICOS expressed or not expressed? So you, you do have the tools um, uh, that, that can guide to a to a big extent your combinations, and and we don't see that companies are taking advantage of that. Hmm. And I mean, it's unfair to say this in in front of Axel because he is one of the people that actually is is doing things the right way. Um, but we see that the vast majority of the industry are still basically flying blind, and, and I'm a little bit perplexed on why that's the case. Uh, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, so one of the reasons that is driving uh, combination therapies is what's called life cycle management. If there is a successful drug already in a given space, uh, you usually add on to that drug or position it versus a new drug in order to you know, maximize benefit for patients, but also remain competitive. And uh, that's in part driving uh, the way uh, combinations are done. This is very historical, the way oncology drug development has been done in the past. Now, there are new components coming to that, but it does take a little bit of time to build it. So I, I remind everybody, immune oncology is four years old as a successful area. And it's moving so fast that it is not entirely possible to do everything by the science and still remain competitive. So there is stuff happening that is plainly driven by life cycle management considerations. And then there are scientific approaches emerging. I give you one example that is actually both. It's a life cycle management concept and it is a scientific approach. So this was actually prior to the Novartis uh, transaction that GSK has done. 
uh, we developed the brafenib and trametinib, a beer of an MEK inhibitor. While these drugs were uh, licensed individually and as a combination in metastatic melanoma, we also characterized them for what they do to the immune system. And they actually have interesting immunological effects that lead to synergy with PD-1 blocking agents. So as a subsequent step, once they were approved, we entered into a partnership with Merck and we entered into a partnership with Metamune to um, combine with PD-1 and PD-L1. And these trials are running. Unfortunately, these trials are not running under GSK label anymore, but they're still running. Right. And we will, we will see data there. And another study that actually follows the same concept was a study with ipilimumab, which was, was not a partnership because the drug was on the market. And uh, we have actually already had interim data on that study. So here I can say that besides the scientific concept of stimulating um, an immune response with a introduction of cell death through a BRF or MEK inhibitor and then manipulating that immune response to checkpoint modulation to provide a patient with very long-term uh, effects. That played out so far in that study, but what we have had to deal with was the toxicity that it engenders. We have seen that two trials that combined a BRF inhibitor with, a, with ipilimumab had either to close those escalation uh, fairly early on from ramorafenib and ipilimumab that was actually published in the New England Journal. That study never continued. And the triplet combination of uh, the brafenib, trametinib, and ipilimumab stopped due to colonic perforations. But the point here is that safety yeah. is not to be underestimated while we're all getting excited Great about efficacy. Yeah. And, and I'd like to ask a couple of uh, viewer questions related to that. One is, will regulators allow combination trials with two non-approved drugs when there is an approved agent such as a PD-1 out there? This is Nate, so I, I'll take that question. I think from a regulatory perspective, trying to suggest what will happen in that situation probably isn't a wise thing to do. I, I think what we can say is, as we look at development of, of novel agents, you know, it does need to be uh, in a patient population where that would make sense. and. Um, I think that is what gets back to our, our prior slide and the prior discussion, which is we think about combinations, we think about approaches. The reality is it, it is about what's going to be beneficial for the patient. And, and the approaches that we are taking here as we think about standards of care that may be combined with an up-and-coming immuno-oncology agent or we think about novel approaches that would be combined I think that if I'm a patient, then I, I want to be able to see a combination of agents, you know, approved and or otherwise, that's going to give me uh, the best, uh, you know, benefit risk ratio of, of what I would need to take. And I think that's what we continue to try to look at as we approach this. It's patient selection, some biomarkers that help us address which combinations might be best. And, and to both Farron and, and, and Axel's comments before, we do think patient selection it's going to also be key to how we really apply these these medicines. It's not just about having the lead PD-1 or even the best in class. We think that patient selection is also going to be critical as we, we look down the road to both combination approaches as well as which ones are going to be the most effective. That's great. I'll ask one last audience question as the great big huge question that to wrap this up with a comment, a quick comment from each of us. Where will oncology be in 10 years? Look forward and what's the big takeaway message from all this evolving science? To measure the last four years, the impact we have created in the last four years between 2011 and today, and project that forward for the next 10 years. Yeah. And I think we will have had even greater impact on cancer. We're talking now, you know, uh, long-term benefit for a larger number of patients. Uh, in some instances, you're familiar with the, um, the concept of elevating the plateau of the survival curve. So the higher that plateau rises, the more patients will actually have long-term benefit. And I expect a lot of that to happen. I I'm very encouraged by the um, standard of care changes that are occurring with uh, just the PD-1 and PD-L1 blockers right now in uh, melanoma and non-spotted lung cancer. 
I think it's just the beginning of the story as biomarkers emerge that enable us to point these drugs in the right places. You'll see great benefit for new populations that have not yet benefited. Mutation load in colorectal cancer mismatch uh, deficient or mismatch repair deficient colorectal cancer uh, is an example. It's moving very fast. The phase three study has just been initiated after the first data came out in ASCO this year. So you have to expect in that 10 year window a massive impact on cancer to occur and large portions of that will be immunotherapy. Yeah, and I would echo that. I'd say I, you could make the argument, and some people have, uh, who are <laughs> more truly in the space than I am, um, that much of the success we've seen historically with many types of drugs, that's going way the back through, you know, uh, original cytotoxic agents, that those patients who did respond and did well may well have been because of the role of the immune system there. We just weren't paying attention to it and keeping our eye on it. So, and I think to, again, Axel, what, to echo what Axel just said, I mean, the presentation that Jerome Galan just did uh, on immunoscore and the role of the host immune system in colorectal cancer and prognosis and how dominant that is compared to anything else that one can look at, driver mutations, et cetera, is really quite amazing. Um, and I think if you combine that with the fact that right now, yeah, we're, we're seeing a lot of successes with what historically were considered kind of immunologically low-hanging fruit, meaning melanoma uh, or bladder or RCC, but the fact that we're seeing the responses that we are, even at this early stage uh, with lung, which was never on the top of the list for quote-unquote immunoresponsive tumors, just suggests that the degree of being able to crack this wide open not just one agent, uh, but with multiple agents and multiple approaches across multiple different tumor types, enabled by clearly uh, various types of, uh, of profiling of patients um, that, you know, it, it's only going to accelerate at a, a dramatic pace. And 10 years from now, I don't know that we'll quite get to where uh, one uh, <clears throat> notable uh, academic president just said about uh, the cures for cancer, but, you know, we'll be getting very close in, in you know, substantive portions of, of many different tumor types. Yeah, to, to, to just expand on that, Jeff, uh, the word cure has been very cautiously used in oncology for so many years. I see people getting more comfortable with it now. So there are patients that live a long time after even just monotherapy with a checkpoint modulator. If you don't throw all the other tools into the mix and make intelligent combinations, we will see great impact for many patients. So the word cure will become something we should all probably be able to use more comfortably. Hi, this is Steve Joseph, and I think we're coming to the end of the session today. Um, thank you, Linda, Axel, Nate, Farron, and Jeff, uh, for the great set of topics you've just covered, for the extensive discussion, and for your individual insights. Uh, we may need a sequel on this both to get to the questions um, that were submitted and also to uh, to the topics that we didn't get to cover. Um, we can talk about that another time, but uh, I did want to let all of the uh, attendees know that the unanswered questions, I uh, will be forwarding them to our panelists and uh, hopefully um, as time allows we'll get you uh, some of those responses to the questions and uh, let you know uh, when they are available. Again, Linda, Axel, Nate, Farron, and Jeff, thank you so much for your participation um, today. And uh, finally, to the audience, on behalf of Defined Health, Bio, LES, Pulling Consulting, and ShareVault, we really appreciate your time and attention and would like to wish everyone a very good rest of the day. Thank you, everybody.